Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames are back from the bye week and a big week against the Oilers this week, I guess. I'm Dan alongside Matt, as always, breaking down the Flames. And Matt, I don't know if you saw on Twitter this week, I proposed that we should rename the Battle of Alberta. Instead of the Battle of Alberta, I think we should call this rivalry the Alberta Beef. Oh, well, it's nice to see that the two teams are actually engaged and have some actual something on the line for a change. Like, it's been nearly 30 years since the Battle of Alberta actually mattered to both teams. And that's a long, long time ago. (laughs) And as we've seen this week, they kind of were into it. Well, before we get to the Alberta beef, let's talk about the other game that the Flames played. The one a lot of people forgot about from this week. And uh, the Flames came back after the bye week, played in the Saddle Dome against the defending Stanley Cup champions. I had some people on the St. Louis Blues management very confused when I asked them if it's a non-title match or if the uh, Stanley Cup was on the line in this one. They just looked at me confused and walked away. But it doesn't matter either way because the Flames didn't win the game. Uh, shootout loss to the St. Louis Blues, 5-4. to four. We saw Buddy Robinson in the lineup here. He even got some shifts in the third period with his old buddy, Johnny Goudreau. Um... Matt, let's start with you. Overall thoughts on this game? I thought that the Flames, like, especially, like, after the All-Star break last year and the team, like, frankly, falling flat on their face after that, uh, right through the end of the season, this was the part of the year that I felt was the important part of the season in how this team had changed from last year. And they came out in this one and considering their opponent they played great and you know the goaltending was a little suspect in this one which is unfortunate but you know Cam Talbot kind of gave up a couple of not so good goals but that happens and the Flames still though persevered and managed to get a point out of it and Frankly, they should have won this game, but, you know, it, it is the defending Stanley Cup champions, so, you know, you, if you get a point out of that, you're kind of A-OK with that. The Flames got two power play goals in the first from Kachuk and Monaghan. Um, Buddy Robinson looked good all night in this one. We also got to see Mark Jankowski score, which is a rarity this year. He got the fourth Flames goal. To me, I thought the team looked okay. They looked like they had some drive. They just looked like a team that had been off the ice for nine days. Yeah, I can see that. But just on, like, the tactical basis, they were... They seemed to be more engaged overall and not the same, like, inconsistent group that we've seen for large portions of the season. And, like, it seemed like they had cohesion throughout the lineup it wasn't perfect by any stretch but it was a lot more of what you saw when this team was actually good last year well on that point uh one of the notes i had here was i thought that johnny and monahan johnny goudreau and sean monahan looked like a top pairing of guys in this game which we haven't seen a lot this season i mean we saw monahan get two goals we saw kachuk get an assist on or sorry uh, goudreau get a ch- uh, an assist on both those goals I thought those guys were in top form here. Yeah, and I think this was Gaudreau's best game thus far this season, frankly. And it, it moving forward, this team will need more performances like this, where they're playing a cohesive game up and down the lineup, and it shows that like this team still does need to acquire something if they do want to actually compete in the postseason and that because of the fact that Buddy Robinson get got slotted into Gaudreau's line for pretty much all three of these games and Derek Ryan was also on the first line yeah it it's one of those where like you need another legitimate body to play in the top six at this point and on the right side and 
like whether you go bargain basement hunting with getting a guy like Kovalchuk or something more you you can't have like insert random guy whether it's Robinson or any of the farm hands as the right winger and actually expect to do anything in the postseason not as high up in the lineup as this team needs no like and that's not to say that Robinson wasn't good actually I thought he was fantastic in all three of the games for what he brings it's just that if he's above your third line you're not going to do a damn thing and he, you know and that's not a slight to him it's just that talent wise he's not on the same level as everybody else and i do like his presence he's a big physical guy with foot speed and to me like as long as he can keep that up and play adequate defensively he should be in the nhl for a while yeah we'll see we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about buddy robinson later i have some thoughts there as well um anything else about this game you want to cover uh, not really. I, I I thought that the Flames acquitted themselves rather well in this one. You know, what I thought we saw St. Points, Louis but... start to really battle back in the third, and I was pleased by how the Flames held their own. Yeah, and like that's with the Flames, like they need to learn how to win games like this one, where you know, because like especially in the postseason, if the Flames make it that far. Like, it's a battle, and there are no easy opponents. Like, as we saw last year, we were number one, they were number eight, and we lost. And, you know, it, it's... In order for Calgary to actually progress and, you know, maybe win a playoff series or, you know, heaven help us actually, you know, go on a run, you know, they have to actually learn how to win these tight checking physical games and they played rather well it didn't end up working for them but this was a far better performance than we've seen in a long time against a higher caliber opponent i think when you're playing the stanley cup champions coming off your bye week and you can squeak out a point you're doing pretty well yeah would have been better if we won but yeah at the end of the day meh well, before we move on to the next game, let's go to some dressing room audio that we got from this game, talking to a couple of players about their thoughts on how the team did here. The Calgary Flames were back in action after a nine-day break. Goaltender Cam Talbot breaks down his thoughts on this game. I mean, you could tell that you know teams coming off uh, nine days off aren't the, the sharpest, so um, you could tell that you know there's some execution issues and um, you know coverage and stuff like that on both ways, so. Um, and coming out of the break, that's kind of what you expect, I guess. Um, you know, we got one big point, but we need the second. And Cam Talbot reflects on his game and how it compared to the rest of the team. About the same, you know, tough to tough start in the first. Um, I thought I made a few good saves, but we need to come up with uh, a couple more there in the first to, you know, keep it closer. And then, you know, we did a great job in the second. I thought I settled down and then thought I played a pretty good third, but um, obviously needed some saves in the shootout. And then Matthew Kachuk broke down his thoughts on this game. Well, I mean, I thought the first uh, first bit of the game we were awesome. Then they scored, and then we got we got two more. And I, I actually thought we were played well up until that point. And then um, had a bad end of the uh, had a bad end to the uh, first period, and then came out really good in the uh, in that second period. And uh, you know, leading going into the third, and let up one early, and you know, could have had another one let up, but thank God for the offside. And, um, you know, they're they're a really good team over there. They're um, you know, they're uh, mature in the way they play. You know, they've got a lot of older veteran guys that play, you know, kind of that playoff hockey st uh, style. And, uh, yeah, once we, they made it 4-4, we didn't have much, uh, many chances, 5-5, um, five five, maybe a couple. Um, you know, and they had a majority late in the third. But um, I thought up until that 4-4 that four, four goal, I thought we played, you know, solid enough to, to win the game. And then Johnny Goudreau was asked to reflect on his thoughts on Buddy Robinson's game tonight and playing together in the third period. Yeah, I thought he was great. Um, I love playing with him in the third. I mean, you know, when I was chipping pucks in, he was all over the puck, getting pucks back. Uh, had a chance to bury there in the third. Um, made a great play to me, too, in the second. Should have buried that. Um, I thought he was great tonight. I thought he did a really good job. And Buddy Robinson is asked if it's special to get another chance to play with Johnny Goudreau after all these years. 
Yeah, for sure. It was uh, it was fun out there. Like, got a couple chances. We uh, laughed about that one. He uh, almost had it on the breakaway. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's like I said, it's a, it's a dream to play with a, a close friend that you grew up with. And but now uh, that first one's out of the way. It's it's over. It's time to go back to work. Here we got a couple big games against uh, Edmonton here. Edmonton here. I hear it's a pretty big rival. So uh, <laughs> if I'm in the lineup, I'll uh, be ready to go, and we'll have some fun with it. And lastly, just Buddy Robinson giving an analysis of his game and how he felt playing his first game in a Flames jersey. Uh, personally, I felt good. It's disappointing not to get two points. You come in here and um, in order to stick, you want to be a part of a winning team. So obviously that's disappointing uh, not to get both points there. But personally, I felt good. I was able to get my feet going and uh, legs were moving. So I just I just want to prove that I can forecheck and be, be a factor at this level. So to uh, get a couple extra, extra shifts there was pretty motivating to me and it's only going to drive me further and uh, work harder so I can uh, make this a full-time thing. Well, Matt, that St. Louis game is in the books, and now we move on. The Flames had a back-to-back, the second game on the road, but not too far up the road. They only had to go uh, up to Edmonton the next night, and the first game of this week's Battle of Alberta series took place, and the Flames ended up winning this one 4-3 to three in a shootout, which isn't what you normally expect from these two teams, but like you said, it's nice to see a competitive again. Um, yeah. I thought here, you know, the, the Flames and the Oilers, when they played before this, it was also 4-3 on the 11th of January. I thought this was a really competitive game on both sides, and I liked the team's overall play. Just up and down, I thought, like the St. Louis game, they were clicking everywhere. Yeah, and I thought Edmonton, and, you know, I think this may be a first uh, in our doing of the show, I thought they actually played well as a team in this game. Yeah, you know, and, I can see and, that. And, you know, and, like, it wasn't just McDavid and Dreisaitl that were playing well. It seemed that all of the players on the Oilers were actually engaged. And they gave the Flames fits at times. And, you know, Calgary had short bursts here and there where they were pretty much imposing their will on the Oilers but it was a back and forth and it was a lot more competitive of a game than what we've come to expect from Edmonton in years past like previously it was basically just stop McDavid and you win but like this seemed to be like everybody was contributing and you know if and I'm going to say something positive about the Oilers if they can actually get that kind of contribution from you know more than just the two guys that they have then they should be a playoff team but you know uh, that they could also just be on a hot streak for a bit and then go and fade away again so you don't know they've uh they've been getting some contribution from yamamoto this week yeah and it, it'll be interesting to see how the dynamics of that team just goes and i think that i can speak for everybody This would be one hell of a playoff series if we ended up facing them in round one. So I know we've talked about some of the disappointment if this team would be one and out. Do you think it would lessen the blow or worsen the blow if it if we're if we were you know one round and out against the Oilers? Oh, it would make it worse because then you know they could make fun of us for the entire off season. But, but at yeah, the same time, no. you know it'll be a good series. Like a lot, sometimes we're not really. I don't want to say not invest in the series, but we're against a team that's just like Colorado that's there that we really don't have any emotional investment in. Yeah, well, the the problem is is that frankly, if the Flames were to play the Oilers in the playoffs, uh, from what I'm seeing of this team right now, I think the Oilers win that series in five games because I don't think that the Flames actually have it in them to up their emotional interest beyond you know and it i just i don't see the flames winning that series at all and i think they'd get embarrassed similarly like they were a year ago yeah i could i don't know if i'd say five but i definitely think that there's a possibility for the first time in a long time that the oilers could end up winning that series yeah, and that I think that the only time that the Oilers would have won a series was that year that they made the playoffs and we didn't. Uh, 
every other year, basically, since, like, 2003, it's been, like, the Flames have been the clearly superior team, and this year, I, I just, between, like, how, like, everybody actually stood up and was mature on their side of things when, in the second Oilers-Flames game this week, and, you know, thumped the Flames, and the Flames' lack of overall cohesion and pushback in that game, I think that that does not s signify a good thing for Calgary moving forward, and it, it'll be interesting to see. Well, let's talk about the game that I wanted to avoid talking about. I wanted to sort of forget this one existed, but uh, Saturday night, the Oilers came back down our way for the home-and-home -home series. The I guess the next round of the Battle of Alberta and not a great result for the Flames here. I think this game will be re remembered for a long time for the goalie fight that we saw, but the Flames get trounced 8-3 to three in this game. And as Captain Mark Giordano said, they were down by two before the, uh, the ice had even dried. Yeah, and it is what it is. Like, it's frustrating, but... Like, this team just was not seeming to be prepared at all. Well, and, and it game. surprises me because, what, 48, 72 hours before when we were in Edmonton, even the St. Louis game, this team looked so good. I mean, yeah, there were some issues, but the team looked good, and it just seems like almost a Jekyll and Hyde scenario. Like, what happened over three days? Yeah. Well, it's like the Flames acted like, and this has been one of those things that the Flames seem to do a lot lately, is that they, if they're going up against a lesser opponent, or in this case, an opponent that they just beat, it's like, oh, well, we beat those guys, or they just outright suck. So we don't have to actually try, and then the, they lose. And, like, we saw this right before the All-Star break, where they were going up against two really bad teams and the Toronto Maple Leafs and they lost to the two really bad teams and they beat the Toronto Maple Leafs and it's like they didn't oh well these guys suck because they're way down in the standings and no respect for the opponent actually being there they didn't try at, to the extent that they should have and they let the other team walk all over them and it was the same with the last game where oh well we beat Edmonton the last game we beat them three times in a row well we'll just beat them again like who big no big deal who cares like they just clearly suck so we don't have to actually respect them at all and with Riddick's celebration and the shootout throwing the stick up in the air you know and don't get me wrong he's a very enthusiastic guy and that's good but that is something that would motivate your opponent. And it's just like when Kachuk picks on the Kings and Drew Doughty all the time. Well, now the Flames games against the Kings, it's the Kings Stanley Cup, and that's the only games that they're actually going to show up for in the season. And now, like, the Flames actually have to try against a loser team and, it, where they, it, you know, under normal circumstances, they just walk all over the Kings. But now they actually have to try, but they... You know, earlier in the season, they lost both of them because they weren't respecting their opponent. They didn't respect the Oilers, and the Oilers thumped them in every facet of the game. And it was a one of the single most pathetic games I've seen the Flames play. Yeah, it was not good for sure. Like we talked about, we had you know two goals early on in the first. The first one was 29 seconds in. The second one a minute and five seconds in. Then Buddy Robinson scores his first goal, his first uh, goal is a flame, and brings it back within striking distance. Then we see McDavid score twice to put them up 4-2, to two, but the Flames were able to get back into this. Maybe that's the only good thing to, I guess, take away, is they were able to get you know 4-3 after the Lindholm goal. And even if you talk to the captain after that, he said, you know what, I think at that point we were within striking distance and once again they let the game get away from them and i don't know if it was just the emotions but you could see in this one especially near the end that the flames were 
running out of gas. They just seemed like they didn't have any anything to give anymore, and they were just getting frustrated. I mean, I probably would too if I was down, you know, seven to three, but they were just getting frustrated by the end. Yeah, and it was not a good look for this team, and I, you know, it begins to make me wonder about the makeup of the team and whether or not the mix of the players is correct and whether or not like maybe the flames should partially tear down and rebuild again like that's how and like that's not it's not just off of this one game like this entire season has been a cluster (coughs) uh of like what are you doing and like that it seems that like a whole bunch of the players are not invested in the games and are just going through the motions and not putting themselves in positions to actually be successful or generate the offense that are is needed and like everything just seems completely disjointed where nobody like Like, last season, the Flames' defense, for example, was one of the highest-scoring defense groups in the NHL, and now, like, we're right down near the bottom in that. And, like, none of the defensemen are actually activating or joining the rush like they were. And similarly, the forwards don't seem to be generating anything off the rush either, and it's like the team is even if we have fast players we're playing a slow game and like it it's like they're just locked in the same like disjointed mode that they were in the playoffs last year and like it seems like none of the players on this team have learned anything from any of the many errors from the all-star break last year and you begin to wonder like do you how do you fix this where like do you just you know like write this season off whether we make the playoffs or not and then just try to you know banded band-aid it for next season or you know do you go on a more like full sale you know full scale realignment of this roster and it's well, Matt, yeah. before we get there, let's just finish off this Edmonton game. I'd love to have that conversation, but let's yeah. finish off this Edmonton game. We do have some audio from some of the players and from the coach. Um, so let's play that here, and then we can come back and talk about maybe some of the disappointment with the roster. The Flames lose 8-3 to tonight in the Battle of Alberta at the Saddle Dome against the Edmonton Oilers. Let's go first to the captain, Mark Giordano. Mark, what were your thoughts on this game? Oh, I mean, it's 2 nothing before... Do nothing before the floods even uh, dry out there. So we're chasing the game all night. I actually thought when it was 4 3, we had a good chance of getting back in this one and, and uh, making it a game. And then a couple breakdowns later, it's 6 3. So we allowed a team that, that thrives on, uh, you know, offense and putting pucks in the net. Uh, we allowed their best players to to really feel it tonight. And that's, that was the difference. They. They uh, got the lead early and never looked back. They, they, you know, when they're when they're getting chances, they're a really dangerous team, and we didn't do a good enough job of eliminating uh, odd man rushes and and uh, zone time. It felt like they had a lot of uh, space out there tonight. Mark, what are your thoughts on what happened at the end of the second period there? Well, it was uh, just a emotional game. Uh, Guy folks your goalie we're gonna we're gonna stand up for each other out there so uh started a little sort of line brawl thing uh thing going there and i thought i thought we did a good job i thought everyone involved did a good job of uh of going i thought Talbs was awesome and uh it was exciting it was, it's like exciting hockey out there but we're not happy at all with the way we uh the way we played tonight we're, i mean if you know if you're gonna give them that those type of chances and those type of rushes they're probably one of the best in the league at it, so they made us pay for 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 playing a really loose game tonight. Talking with Flames goalie Cam Talbot. Cam, what made you react the way you did there at the end of the second period? The score. Um, didn't like the fact that you know he comes in and uh, spears me when I'm on my back after the whistle. So I mean those 
in a game like that. It was just um, kind of set you off, and I reacted accordingly. Probably not the, the smartest reaction on my part, but it is a highly emotional game, and my emotions got the best of me. Cam, did you feel compelled to meet Mike Smith there at center ice with him already being there? What was going on in your mind at that time? It was just, again, one of those things. It was an emotional reaction. Um, I was already kind of in a couple of scrums, and then I saw him standing there. So it was just, yeah, one of those things. Just react to it, and you know, I didn't expect to get thrown out of the game for it. I thought it was just more of a five-minute major kind of thing, but. Um, unfortunately, we're going to go back in there, and I feel bad that uh, I made that decision and put him in that spot. Cam, you had a unique opportunity tonight. You were watching the game, and then you got to play in it, and then you were watching it again. From your vantage point, what went wrong for the team tonight? Um, you know, I thought that um, we made a push there in the second. We got a couple quick goals, made it 4-3, and then uh, it was just... You know, we just couldn't make that extra play to get out of our zone. They turned a lot of pucks over in our zone and continued the zone time and, um, you know, got a lot of chances from there. So uh, just a little better execution on our part and just moving the puck out and not giving their guys second every opportunities because their offense is too good. And now for some post-game thoughts from Coach Jeff Ward. Coach, after a game like this, what can you hope that your team takes away? Oh, well... I mean, everybody saw the same thing. They were good and we weren't, you know, so um, what can we control? That's how we prepare to play again. You know, lessons we take out of this, we got to be way more competitive. You know, I thought some of our guys were. I thought as a team, overall, we, we could have been more competitive. Um, so, yeah. And, Coach, your thoughts on the incidents there at the end of the second period? Um... You know, I thought, well, I mean, Talbs must have taken some, you know, I haven't talked to him, but, you know, it looked like the whistle had gone and the guy was digging up the puck. He took exception to it, and then away you go. You know, it's like, uh, you know, throwing a, throwing a spark on dry tender. You know, like, you know, what can you say? I mean, at that point, he's pissed off. It's probably good that he was. Um, I know where it goes. Coach, as a whole, was your team pissed off enough tonight? Um, well, you'd have to ask them that to get a real answer. I mean, it, it didn't look like we were. It looked like some of our guys were. Um, but collectively, I thought we, uh, you know, we, we needed to be way better. Looking at the score, it would look as though goaltending was the issue for your group tonight. Do you feel like your team gave your goalies what they needed here? No, not at all. I mean, uh, we had some breakdowns in our own end. I, I didn't think uh, we were very good uh, early at the front of our net. Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of goals where you know we didn't execute what we needed to execute on the defensive side of the puck, um, and they took advantage of it. You know, uh, it's, the first two goals were directly us. You know, and you're two shifts into the hockey game, you're down 2 nothing. you're chasing the game. So um, right from that, we needed to be you know, way more, you know, way more cognizant of what was happening on that side of the puck. And it's, you know, at this time of year, defense gives you a chance to win. You know, tonight our defensive game uh, was exposed a little bit and it put us uh, behind the eight ball early. Well, Matt, as you could hear, the coach echoing a lot of our sentiments, you know, not sure what's going on with this team. Um, you could just tell everybody disappointed, even Cam Talbot disappointed in his own actions. So going back to what you were talking about earlier, I think a lot of people are asking this. And we even had one of our listeners write in, John Wallace Howell, who's at John Howell 77 on Twitter. He asked, why do we continue to struggle in key games? Only won one playoff game since 14-15 and came out flat in a huge game at home. You just can't trust this team to bring their A game when they need to. And that kind of echoes what you were talking about earlier, Matt. So, I mean, yeah, we could blow it up. Yeah, we could do some of the things you're mentioning. But what do you think is at the root? Like, what's causing this? Like, part it, of it is It seems is to that... me like the Flames started kind of believing their own hype at the beginning of the year. Well, not only that, but... 
you look like a, a couple years ago when the Flames uh, missed the playoffs that that year that we didn't have the uh, first round pick, um, and the Flames they were not getting very much in line of the contributions from the depth players in that year. And, like, when we headed into this season, like, we expected Michael Backlund to be a 40-point guy. You expected Frolik to be a 30-ish point guy. You expected Bennett and Lucic to be a 25, 30-point guys. Jankowski to maybe get 15-ish goals. You know, and, like, contributions from everybody up and down the roster just chipping in here and there. And... Like, frankly, Backland has not, for a large portion of this season, has not looked like an NHL player. Um, Froelich, it was the same thing. That's why he was in and out of the lineup. Jankowski, you know, if you replaced him with half of the guys on Stockton, you wouldn't notice any difference. And, like, you can go up and down the lineup, and, like, uh, and then it doesn't help on top of it where, like, previous years you'd get bailed out when Gaudreau and Monaghan would have a good game but they've been awful for a large portion of the season too and like the Flames are the seventh worst team in the NHL for goal differential and that's to me is always the best indicator of like how good a team is and like the Flames are legitimately one of the worst teams in the league in terms of generating offense and playing defensively like it there's it seems that, like, there's only maybe five guys on this roster out of the 18 skaters that I think are playing adequately or good. And, you know, you, it's hard to win very many games when you only have, like, a third of your lineup actually performing at a level that they should be based on both where they are in the lineup and what they're getting paid and and i think when you say performing you're talking about performing consistently right yeah and the five guys by the way are um derek ryan uh kachuk lindholm brody and anderson and uh, like those guys have all been playing at a level that you would expect them to play at and they've been fairly consistent throughout the season even Kachuk has struggled lately so you know that's not ideal but it's frustrating because like when you have like the rest of your lineup where like Gaudreau and Monaghan are severely underperforming Backlund is a shell of himself like it, at this rate like he would be he's more of a fourth liner with how he's playing and uh, Lucic is a press box guy, and like we, you know, there's just too many guys that are just playing as if that they should be bought out, frankly, and that's how bad a whole bunch of the players on this team are playing, and it's hard to move forward when, like, in years past, like last year, what was the strength of this team is that, like, say Gaudreau and Monahan are not playing a top end game you could throw the second line out then the third line out and the fourth line out and they'd all be contributing in their own way and they'd have positive energy and sometimes they, they would score and they would be the ones driving the offense but now like unless either the first or second line are doing something it's like the the third and fourth line are complete black holes and it's hard to get any true momentum throughout the lineup when you're only getting occasional contributions from here there and everywhere so obviously we know this team isn't going to blow it up in the offseason they're not going to trade you know all of their top six except for Lindholm and Gachuk realistically what do you think we do to fix this well you know to me like I never like trading good players period, um, unless you're getting another equally good player in return. Like, just trade, like say trading Gaudreau for prospects and draft picks, that is 
stupid, frankly, because you're not going to end up... Most of the time, the players and prospects that you get back, you, you might get a second or third line player for Gaudreau, and at the end of the day, that doesn't really even help you at all. So, like, unless you're trading Gaudreau for an equivalently talented guy, then fine, but it just it doesn't realistically make sense, nor do trades like that actually happen too often. And um, coming off a bad year, I mean, I hear a lot of people saying maybe it's time to trade Goudreau, and you and I have thrown that around too, but we also have to remember that coming off a bad year, he's not going to be worth as much as he would have been, say, that you know this time last year. Yeah, like you're, like honestly, for Goudreau, you might get a first, a decent, like a late first-ish caliber prospect, and maybe a second round pick. That's all you'd get, because uh, he's a small winger. It, you know, it's not like he's a big franchise center or something. You're not going to get a ton for him, you know, at the end of the day. Like, it's, you know, uh, just the market. Like, you don't get that much for that type of player, especially one coming off such a bad season. To me, I think we need to, because we're not going to or can't blow this up and get value, like you said, we might not get what those players are worth, I think, and we've seen them do this a little bit, but they definitely need to shore up the right side depth and they need to rely on different people. I think we're starting to see the guys like Goudreau, maybe Monaghan, I don't know if it's so much him or if he's sort of playing off uh, Goudreau, but I think with those two, they they don't have the drive to to go consistently, and that's what you need from your top line guys. They need to be ready to go every night. They need to be re- well ready to play at their best every night. We're not seeing that, and I think I don't know if you can move either one of them. I don't think you do it at the deadline. If you do, I think it's a draft move, and we're seeing the team do this already. I think we need to rely on Lindholm, Kachuk, and some other right winger as the the core of this team, the guys that seem to have that killer instinct. Yeah, and I think that, like, moving forward, like, that, to me, like, what I would do to fix this situation would be to look at swapping out depth pieces in this team. And, like, the Jankowskis of the world, and, like, even, uh, like, uh, you look at uh, guys like Backlund, move him out, and... Well, yeah, like even if you're just getting similar guys, and like even on the back end, like moving Hamannick out, and maybe even T.J. Brody at the deadline, if we're, the Flames go into seller mode, like say the next few weeks are bad, and they slide out of a playoff spot, then you know it might be seller mode, and you know like cycle some of those guys out of the lineup and instead like just even getting like a different version of the same guy i think just getting different people in would help too often in the nhl they like to dance with the devil they know Mm -hmm. if you're you mentioned mark jankowski um if you're mark jankowski would you be afraid of buddy robinson right now to me he's played his way onto the lineup in the three games he's given us at this point i would i would try waivers with janko and give his spot to Robinson. Well, I would wait um, just because I think that you could include Jankowski in any number of trades. That like if you're gonna add to this team, Jankowski is a decent enough piece. That like if you're a a bad team like L.A. or Montreal, a six foot four center who scored 17 goals last year, that is actually attractive just because of the fact that, like, if he does bounce back, then you've got a decent third-line guy for nothing, basically. Like, in terms of payroll, not, like, acquisition costs. So, you know, it, we'll see. But, like, honestly, with how Jankowski and even Lucic have played this year, if you inserted the name of, I think, seven or eight forwards from Stockton... Uh, I don't see that you would do any worse than what they have this season, and frankly, I think you'd get better results from a good portion of those players. You mentioned Lucic, and we got some feedback about him as well. Rene 
Couture at Rain underscore Couture on Twitter said Saturday night was a huge disappointment. Lucic especially. I kept thinking throughout the game that this was the game Lucic could make an impact and he never delivered. Not that I expect much from him, but does Saturday's effort make you wonder what he adds to the lineup? You know, I think coming in, these were the games we were looking for him for. You and I talked in the summer when he got acquired that he adds some grit to this team and when the team needed grit, he wasn't there. And and I think, you know, Renee's got a good point here of what's he bringing to the lineup at this point? Well, and that's... That's going to be a lot tougher contract to move out from. Yeah, and honestly, I think that the Flames are stuck with that one for at least until July 1st of the year prior to his last season. Because, like, once that bonus payment is made, the last two years of his contract, there's going to be some team out there that says, hey, we can use his him as a cap floor, you know, vehicle and so that's the summer you know, of without 2022 out, yeah um so we're stuck with them basically now this year and next but um i think that at that point because then he'd only have the one payment left and then he's a league minimum player for his actual contract for the two seasons and a lot of teams would be like hey well he's getting you know we're getting like nearly 11 million dollars worth of cap hit for like six million dollars that's not too bad so you know yeah i I think you know i mean right now if we're looking at the and you tell me if you think somebody different but if we're looking for sort of that punchy i don't want to say fighter because we're not looking for a fighter but the sandpaper guy i think ronaldo is doing that same job far better for less than a million bucks yeah i i think so too and the problem, uh, it just stems back to that James Neal contract. The Flames thought they were getting one player and they didn't get him. And they got a, the shell of himself and they were stuck because you can't buy out the Neal contract last season. Like, you know, just optics wise and dollar wise, it would have just destroyed the team. And so, unfortunately, the Flames are stuck paying $5.4 million for an AHL talent. I want to give Lucic some time to bounce back another season. I mean, nobody's been good this year, so I think it's... It's unfair to paint Lucic with, you know, an un, with the same or with a different brush. But I think next year you could see... I don't think he's going to justify his contract, but I think you could see a better season from Lucic. Yeah, well... We'll see. Um, like, at this rate, as bad as it sounds, I think that the Flames would actually be better served if they had another player in the lineup, period, and just not have him playing. So to answer and, sort of what you were saying earlier, and my take on what John was saying, is I think at this point, I mean, the guys that we're seeing... And yeah, Kachuk's struggle a little bit, but everybody struggles at some point. The guys that we're seeing who are really showing us they can handle the pressure of being top guys on a, you know, on a team for 82 games are Lindholm and Kachuk. And I think, honestly, we need to find somebody else on that line, whether that's a center or a right winger, depending on how you look at Lindholm. And I think we need to start looking at Goudreau Monaghan as depth pieces, as middle six guys. And I think if we can do that, this team can position themselves a little bit better to find the right people to take this team long term. I think that at this point, Goudreau, Monaghan have not shown us they're the guys this team can ride all the way to a Stanley Cup. And I think if we can start looking at our lineup differently and acquiring complementary pieces to Lindholm and Kachuk, not to Goudreau, Monaghan, I think that's how this team's going to get better results. Yeah, and I think that. The Flames will, in order to, like, take that next step, the Flames, I believe, are going to have to find additional top six players, whether that's internally, like, having guys like Dubé and Peltier turn out, or, uh, you know, acquiring anybody, frankly, that's a top six 
forward. But it I doesn't th- really matter. I think if you look at Goudreau and Monaghan as, you know, second line guys then, I think the ability to trade them just, you know, from a fan perspective becomes that they I don't want to say they become more expendable, but they're not your top two players, which are always hard guys to trade. At this point, honestly, if we can find a team who's willing to give us, you know, I, I don't want to say equal value because I don't know if you'll get it, but a, a team who's willing to give you an NHL top six guy for Goudreau, I'd pull the trigger. Yeah, so would I. You know, even if you just and- kind of swap them for a right winger somewhere. Um, I could see doing a deal, and I think the return might make sense if we did Goudreau and something for a guy like, um, you, you know, to, to Philadelphia for one of their wingers. Who's the guy I'm thinking of? Um, hold on, let me look him up. Uh, what division are they in? Like, I think that Philly, he wants to go to Philly, Johnny does. I could see them doing that deal for a guy like Konechny or even Voracek. And I, I think you could I think you could make a Konechny deal work. Yeah. Who's a right winger. But if we're looking at Lindholm Kachuk as the as sort of the guys to ride, I'm not convinced at that point they need a right winger. I think Lindholm is your right, Kachuk's your left, and you need a solid center for those guys. Yeah, and it- that's the problem, though, is that it's hard to find those guys, period. Like, that's why, I like, Lindholm as a center makes more sense, just because it is so difficult to get a legitimate top six center, And they've been period. playing Kachuk on the right, so I know you're a big fan of bringing in Taylor Hall. You could, you could theoretically bring Hall in and do Hall-Lindholm-Kachuk on that line, if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, uh, that could work, and there, there's all sorts of permutations. Like for wingers, I don't like. I'm not one that like. I've never been one to say, oh well, just because he's a left shot, he needs to be on the left side. Like to me, the wingers are always interchangeable, um, just because there's always far fewer right-handed shots than left-handed shots anyway, so you couldn't even do that normally anyway, but the team, I think, just needs to get some additional talent and get some more youth in the team as well, and that's why, like, for me, like, I don't know, like, this team all, all season has looked bad frankly and I think that in order to do like what I think needs to happen I think they need to start like a mini rebuild of the lower lines and because they're gonna need to get a lot of good pieces for the third and fourth lines moving forward and as well as a couple top six But I don't think we and... have much to give for those. You're going to have to just sort of either sweep up UFA extras or build from internal. Yeah, and like that's why like I would almost be wanting the team more to be on seller mode to try and get some assets and just like, you know, punt the season. And because frankly the flames only have like maybe six prospects that are any good at this point and it, it it's hard because like the, you can't really say oh well this guy for sure is going to be an nhl player and it also makes it difficult to like make a trade either because of the fact that like the only asset that you have are draft picks and the flames frankly have too many holes to be able to bandage them up with the amount of prospects they have we'll talk more about trades as we get close to the deadline but i'm almost thinking at this point johnny as you mentioned might not be the piece that gets you the most i'm thinking the team's almost better to move Brody for a forward because it's generally easy to move defensemen for forwards. Let's say bring in a middle six centerman and then in the off season trade Monahan for picks or someone lower down in the lineup. I think centermen are easier to get value for and especially a bigger centerman than Goudreau. I think that might honestly be the way to do this is get rid of 
Brody for a top six guy. I'm even looking at, say, a team like Toronto. If you could move Brody for Kapanen in a pick or something, I know he's a right winger, but that solves your right wing issue. Um, you know, I just think that moving Brody for ideally a centerman or a right a right winger, and then looking at moving Monahan for some sort of value at the draft might be the way to go. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, I think this team just needs to... I don't necessarily want to move Monaghan, but if you look at him and Goudreau as no. probably the best trade pieces we have, I think well, it might I, be inevitable. You know, honestly, honestly, I would rather like do the first part that you said, like uh, Brody for Kapanen or, you know, insert I you know center right winger of that general caliber but then find another top six forward and try to like get some additional depth parts for this team and then go back at it for next season because like honestly i don't think that either monahan or goudreau are as bad as they have been this season i think this is just a weird off year for everybody. Yeah, but I, I, I still think those guys... I mean, if you look at it, and I said this last year, Monaghan's a number two center on a good team. I think, you know, with Lindholm emerging the way he is, I think Monaghan becomes our number two. Yeah, and I think he's fine. a better number two than he's shown. Yeah, no, and, like, that's, like, what I'm meaning, though, is that, like, you have Monaghan as your second-line center. And, like, have Lindholm as your first-line center. Yeah. And, you know, or, you know, whatever you get for Brody, if you get a center instead, then throw that guy on the first line. But, you know, like, you look at teams that generally are competitive, like, they usually have, like, two first lines, frankly. And I think that if the Flames could get two legitimate other players for Kachuk, Lindholm, and uh, Monaghan and Gaudreau, in addition to, like, rearranging deck chairs on the depth parts, I think this team is fine. Like, Shillington has played better. Valimaki should be good to go for, at least for next season, and I think he should be able to contribute a little bit this year. And between, like, all of those things, I think this team could like rekindle the magic so to speak for next season it's just that like the flames have to cycle some deck chairs out and similarly like moving backland you like you mentioned brody for uh top six forward similarly backland's a very decent two-way center i think at this point on, you have like to a eat third some line on backland yeah but you could have probably get a decent young defenseman or good defensive prospect or even draft picks for uh backland and like you could kind of like swap brody for the forward you want and swap backland for the defenseman you want cycling the deck chairs on both those parts while actually improving your team overall see and, and i think one of the issues the flames are going to have building depth from within is we haven't had a lot of picks in the last couple of years because we moved them no. for Hamannick or, you know, um, Hamilton. So I think you could even make the the argument that, you know, maybe you trade Backlund for some picks and just try to... Because if we're starting to bring guys like Godden up or Phillips up, that leaves the cupboards very empty. So I think that, you know, there might be something to be said of, you know what, let's just move Backlund for some picks or, you know, let's move Hamannick for some picks and you know, sort of rebuild that way too. I think that there's centers that might be available You uh, on July 1st. I think a guy like Charlie Coyle you could get for a decent price who might be a better fit there. Yeah, and there's all sorts of different ways you can get that, like what you need. It. I think that the Flames just need to cycle some deck chairs around to get what, overall what they need. And one of the good things is that even though the Flames haven't had a ton of picks lately, uh, on the higher end part at least, they've both been hitting on virtually every pick in the top three rounds since treliving has been the general manager, and they've been getting value out of their depth round choices as well. And that's been a blessing for this team because of the fact that... like. A, 
in total, all from rounds one through three, the only pick that the Flames have missed on since Treliving's been the general manager is Tyler Parsons, who's still a decent goalie prospect. And like every other player is in the NHL. Well, I think Parsons' like, thing is he's just got to stay healthy for us to be able to evaluate him. Yeah, and goalies are weird at the best of times. I mean, times, goalies so need starts, and Parsons has been hurt so much he just hasn't had a lot of play time as a professional hockey player. Yeah, so you know, and but literally every other top six or first three rounds of picks that the Flames have made since 2015, each one of those guys has made the NHL and is actually contributing. So that's a good thing. And like, if the Flames can acquire more picks, regardless, with their seemingly more improved uh, scouting group that you know they can translate any of those additional picks into talent period and it's just frustrating well, and, and, like I mean, this... you mentioned Backlund and some of his struggles and I think last year Backlund and even the year before I think Backlund and Froelich both looked better on that 3M line than maybe they should have and I think Kachuk might have been held down by that line a bit and I'm glad to see Kachuk getting some top line minutes but we've seen Backlund play on the wing and right now we're seeing him play on the fourth line with Bennett and Jankowski that's a very expensive fourth line to be putting your 5.35 million dollar center there well and that's you know it with Derek Ryan playing so well, you know, it kind of... But it does. Makes... It makes you wonder if it's time to move on from Backland. Well, and that's why, I like, you know, a lot of teams would love Michael Backlund. You're, like, you're not going to get... You, you look... val- you're not going to get necessarily equal value, but he's the guy I think you'd get a couple picks for. You can easily get a first-round pick for Michael Backlund. T- centers, especially good two-way centers, always get a, you a first-round pick. I do that. You know, you get, you know, like you look back in the years gone by, like Paul Gostad got a first and a fourth, uh, Hansel got a first and a second. Like, there's a lot, uh, you know, anybody that's has a similar profile to Michael Backlund, you're getting a first plus, and you know that's why I like. Whether the Flames get a draft pick for Backlund if they were to trade him or get a good young defenseman instead, which that's the way I'd kind of go for myself, I'd try to snag that defensive guy. You want that Fox kid? No, Fox him. (laughs) I hear he's good. Yeah. Well, you know, but like if you can get... Because the Flames have a good young defense core like if you can get and frankly you look at the prospect pool for our defensemen and it's like um there's nobody there Uh, but i also don't feel like we need somebody next year that we don't have like i feel like the defense we've got taken care of between anderson's extension if valimaki stays healthy i feel like that one's taken care of we can afford to draft a guy and wait two three years oh i know uh, and that's why it's like either you get a already picked guy and like it would be somebody that was drafted last year like in the top two rounds uh, that's what i would be expecting or just drafting the guy yourself one way or the other some sort of defenseman return just because of the fact that like if you were to able to swap brody for a forward you know and th- that way you could kind of fix both problems simultaneously yeah this team also likes stone though so i could see them just swapping brody and putting stone in the lineup yeah same that works too and you know the, at least for now bring and, davidson up as your number seven and give his minutes in stockton to valimaki yeah and then ride out the season and see what you know insert miscellaneous ufa defenseman signing you know, and it would just need to be like a three-four guy, not a number one-two guy. Well, and, and um, I think if you if you move Brody, I think then there's more of a reason to potentially keep Hamonic as your three-four guy. Yeah, like I I'd be open to keeping Hamonic. You know, they, just because we don't have anybody quite like him in the organization, and he's so well liked. 
in the room. I think you've but... as much as you could sell both. You're right. It does. It does lead them to having some defensive depth problems. I think you kind of got to pick one and trade the other. Well, you know, alternatively, if you're just going like say the Flames struggle the next few weeks and just they're out of the playoff spot and they just decide to sell, then by all means, get rid of both. Deal with it later. Sell. Yeah, and you know, a third pairing of Stone and Davidson. Yeah, that's ugly, but at that point, who gives a crap? <laughs> and you know, if you're just playing out the string, that'll do for the well, last Well, and I think if Brad and... moves both those guys, I mean, we saw him bring in Fantenberg last year. Like, you can find some depth defenseman to bring in for the last yeah. few games. Yeah, even if it's just a waiver pickup, like, fine, who cares? Like uh, Chris Stewart the year before, mm-hmm. where it was just like, okay, sure, you're a body, that works. And, yeah, no, and this team... Like, there's lots of different ways that this team can go, and, like, it, it'll be interesting to see because of the fact that the Flames, their next eight games, only one of those games is against a team that's in the playoffs, and that's a game against Vancouver, and, like, everybody else, it's nothing but deadbeats. So if the Flames basically do not go on a huge protracted winning streak over the next two weeks... That's not really a good sign for this no. team. And, you know, like, they basically should be winning, going on, like, a 7-8 game winning streak right now because they're playing the worst teams. <laughs> this is when this team so, can build up some points quickly. Yeah, and so, like, that, this will be what, to me, like, even if the Flames play at 500 over the next couple weeks until the trade deadline, to me, that's not good enough. And... Like, they basically have to win most of these games. They have 10 games between now and the deadline. Yeah, and you'd get a really good idea over the next eight because they're they're basically playing the losers of the Western Conference plus Vancouver. You know, and you should be murdering these teams if you're actually wanting to make the playoffs and all that. And, like, if this team is a pretender and, like, you know, the goal differential thing that I mentioned earlier, if that's accurate and, like, this team just isn't very good, they won't be very good against these teams. But if they start, like, just walking all over the other guys, then, okay, they're coming alive and maybe they're, you know, they've just been kind of taking it easy, conserving their energy in order to get hot at the right time. I think in these next and, three weeks, it's really now or never. I think if this team's not in a playoff yeah. spot by the 24th, which is the deadline, they're not going to make the playoffs. I'd sell. Like, honestly, even if they are, like, up by, like, two points, frankly, I'd be like, sell, please. Well, and I just, talked about this with you before the bye week on our last show, is should we just sell and hope for the best? Like, I think this is, Honestly, this is the year I think we have the rate, most assets to sell. I think in some yeah, ways you say, let's, and, you know, if we can make the playoffs, great. If we don't, oh, well, let's sell what we got and move on from yeah. there. I, to me, honestly, I'm fully in the sell everything that you can move that is not a core I think you got to sell like, all the UFAs at the very least, including yeah, Talbot, if you like, can get to value. Me, yeah, like, to me, honestly, like, Gaudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, Lindholm, those guys are untouchable. Derek Ryan, I'd include in the untouchable just because he's good for what he is. And uh, the any of the young kids, either up front or on the blue line, keep them. Everybody else, if you get the right price, so be I it. I mean, based on what you're kind of talking about here, then the saleable forwards, Lucic, Jankowski, Backlund, Bennett, uh, the saleable... To- I'd add Bennett... I'd be he- reticent to trade Bennett unless the other team overpaid. But, you know, he's available ish. I wouldn't but, be looking for know. a deal for Bennett, but I'd be willing to include Bennett to get the right value back. Exactly. Um and then I think, you know, on the back end I don't I don't move the captain. You don't move Anderson. Honestly, actually, if you got the right deal for Giordano 
I would. Really, I think right now your yeah. best you've got Hamannick and Brody, and if you're not going to get a deal for those guys, you're not going to get a deal for the captain. Well, the thing is, is that like it would not be one of those interesting things where if you could. I think if you're going to sell Gio, you had to do it last Hamannick. year after the Norris nod. He's not looking good this year. Yeah. Well, it's one of those where if the right, you know, like if you got a good, you know, like two first or, you know, equivalent prospect to be two first for Giordano, you have to look at it at least. And, you know. To me, the captain is untouchable, Anderson's untouchable, and Hannafin's untouchable on the back end, which leaves you Brody, Hamannick, Stone. Nobody wants Stone, so Brody, Hamannick. And yeah. I think you've got to shop Talbot around as much as I don't like say because yeah. he's a good goalie. I mean, if you can give value there, he's on a one-year deal, move him and bring Gillies up. Yep, I agree. Um, you know, another thing I was just thinking about as you are mentioning that, as much as I know where you're coming from on some of these guys saying, well, don't get picks, go get a prospect, we've also seen what Treliving can do with picks. And I think for him, picks just another currency. I would have no problem in some ways taking a pick over someone else's prospect and then letting him go wheel and deal at the deadline, but or sorry, the draft, but then still have draft picks. Like, let's say we could get three yeah. firsts and he wants to move two of them. Hey, we've still got a first. Yeah. Well, exactly, and like you look in 2015, the Flames had a first uh, three thirds and two, th or three seconds and two thirds, and they were able to package one of the fir the first and two of the seconds for Hamilton, and then traded the two thirds to get the pick that ended up being Shillington. So that they ended up walking out of that draft with Hamilton, Shillington, and Anderson, and. Well, you just got half your defense core for the next mm -hmm. 10 years. And I think that, like, if the Flames were to go the route of getting a whole bunch of draft picks, and frankly, you know, like the James Neal pick, that's going to be an additional third for this team. So, you know, like, this, we're going to have at least four picks in the top three rounds, and if the Flames can, say, make that six or seven or eight, that would be even better. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily but, expect them to make all the picks, but it gives them currency. No, no, and like that's why I would be more on the sell mode, just because of the fact that the Flames don't really have anything in the prospect system outside of Peltier and Yellison, I guess, on the back end, and then long shots like Phillips and. Uh, I think, I think Phillips and, and a handful Godden of other guys are are not necessarily long shots. I think they're bottom six guys. They're probably pretty much shoe ins to be bottom six at some point. Yeah, you, you. What I'm meaning by long shots is long shots to be like top end guys, like you know, like a Gaudreau level pick or anything another reason. Like I think that. this like might it, be know. the right year to sell, especially in the West. Everyone's so close. I think there's going to be a lot of buyers and no sellers. I think, you know, you'll get L.A. selling, you'll get, um, you know, Montreal selling, but I think there will be a huge market for buying, and I think you might be able to get more than some of these guys are worth this year. Yeah, well, like, if you look at, like, the Eastern Conference, the teams that are, like, clearly out of it, um, Montreal only has basically Kovalchuk that they would be wanting to sell. The Rangers have Kreider and nothing else that they wouldn't want to be keeping. Buffalo doesn't really have anything that's expendable. Ottawa doesn't have anything that's expendable because they sold that all last year. New Jersey, they already sold Hall. They, they, they have only got prospects and mediocrity. And Detroit has nothing because <laughs> they only have like 20 there's a points. lot of depth on those teams like, if you're looking to acquire depth i think you'll be able to do that yeah yeah like if you want a fourth line guy yeah sure but that's not like ha most teams have those guys available but like calgary actually has legitimate middle six and you know higher end defensemen and you know none of the other teams that are 
in the the lower end seem to well in a lot of those lower end teams their pieces are ufas so they could like i could see somebody going after duclair or nemesnikov at ottawa as rentals but if you're looking for something that's you know that's higher end especially on the back end i think calgary would have the best high-end defenseman to sell i think la might move muzzin as a as a uh ufa rental they did last year didn't they with uh toronto is he in toronto now oh yeah. you're right yeah my bad um yeah so i mean toronto sorry that's what i meant toronto could move him because he's on the last year of his deal like oh, yeah. la did last year um but i think that there's there's and toronto's in the playoffs they probably wouldn't do it i i mean he i think teams would want him but he's i think that team's going to the playoffs so Unless, you know, Winnipeg, if they're not in, could be an interesting seller. But I think Calgary could have the best high-end defenseman available. And because there's nobody selling, I think you could probably get more than these guys are worth. Yeah, and that's another reason why I'd be wanting to test the market. Because of the fact that everybody's in the market, basically. I... Because, like, even, like, you go into, like, Nashville, who's uh, 11th right now, they're only four points out of a playoff spot, and, like, they have three games in hand on Arizona. So, you know, like, there's only four teams in the West and five in the East that are clearly out of it, and even those teams are not very good other than San Jose, but all their important pieces are injured, so that's why... The sh- part of the reason why the Sharks are bad. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those where Calgary, if they decided to sell, they'd mop the floor with it because of the fact that they're basically the one-stop shop and they could make out like bandits. Here's an interesting... We'll talk more about um, the trade as the deadline comes up, but just poking around the league right now, tell me what you think of this. If Calgary were to sell one of their defensemen, I can see a team that's pushing in the East being the Islanders. I don't think the Islanders part with Eberle, though I think that could be an interesting pickup. What if you could get Josh Bailey off of them? That would be interesting. Right? I mean, the Islanders, they've got crappy defense. They've got Letty and Pollock, Taves and Mayfield, Dobson and Boychuk. I'm surprised Boychuk's still around. Um, Yeah. You know, like, I could see them wanting a a top-end defenseman. Uh, Oh, yeah, for sure. And, like, their their defense is just merely adequate. Like, there's not really anything to write home about. And, you know, Calgary would be a very good destination. And the thing is, is that the Islanders also have a, a number of high-quality prospects in their organization, too. So I mean, if you could, sw- but whether it's, if you could swing it, I'd do yeah. something like Brody and Jankowski for either Bailey and Ever- or Everly and Del Colley. Yeah. Go out and get uh, get Everly from the Islanders. Go out and get Hall in the summertime. You've you've got Talbot here. You got Lucic here. You can rebuild the Oilers. <laughs> oh God. Edmonton Oilers South. Um, but I mean, and we'll talk more. But wouldn't that mean that we'd suck too? <laughs> well, I don't know if it was the players. I mean, some of those players are doing great elsewhere. Oh, I know. I'm just, you know. Making but, yeah, I, I think we'll, you like, know, we'll talk more about some of those guys as we get close to the deadline. But I do think it's it's time to take a hard look. Not at blowing this team up by any stretch. But I think, no. on the like I said, on the forward side, changing your perspective of who the key guys are. And on the back end, really looking at what value we can get. Well, the thing is, is that. Um, I'll be quite upset if we like go one of the, if we go for a playoff run, hold all our assets, don't make it, or get blown out in five, and lose the ability to, to get value from those guys. Yeah, like that'd be, and there's a good reason why no Canadian team has won the Stanley Cup since 1993. The, the Canadian teams all seem to rush and like, oh, we got to be competitive because our fans expect us to be in the playoffs instead of doing things right and like you look at boston like they had the success in the early part of the last decade and they won the stanley cup against vancouver and all that and then they were basically in a similar spot that the flames are now where their team was kind of waffling and 
not clicking properly. And so they ended up selling off a handful of pieces. They ended up being worse the next year, but then they bounced back. And now, like, they were in the Stanley Cup Finals last year. They're the second best team in the East and are a legitimate cup contender again. And Calgary, I think, in order to take these next steps into not just being a playoff team, but a contending team, I think they need to manage their assets to the, you know, and if something's not working, move it. And, like, Backland and the defense core as it sits is not working correctly. So you can make adjustments, and, you you know, even if you're not as good on paper with your defense core, but you can add on other aspects, like you can change the dynamic of the team and improve over the long term and especially with the Flames scouting abilities like they've been really dynamite since 2015 like each draft has been really good for them pretty much so you know like if they can learn to trust in themselves and their ability to find the correct talent to move this organization forward I think that that would be the ideal thing and you know, like, if Boston had selected better in that draft when they had the 15th, 16th, and 17th overall pick, they probably would have won the Stanley Cup last year. Because, <laughs> you know, Barzal and uh, Konechny and uh, Chabot were the next three picks. And, you know, if they had taken those three guys instead of the three that they did take, that uh, I, they definitely would have won the Stanley Cup last year and probably would win again this year coming back to the flames though i think one thing we've seen from this team as well is they tend to be homers for their own picks there's guys they hang on to longer than they should because they're a flames draft pick or they've been in our system for a while and i think well that's admirable i think sons you need to say you know what it doesn't matter if we picked them or someone else picked them like you said it's not working let's move them and i think that might be the feeling with jankowski right now yeah, well, like, you know, like, I've been saying, like, oh, well, trade Giordano or Brody or Backlund. It's not that I don't like those players. Uh, you know, I like, you know, both as people and on the ice. I like them as players, but something's not working, so you gotta make changes. It's part of the business. And, like, even before, like, when the Flames, like, ten years ago, like, when Conroy was... Uh, uh, you know, still on the team in that. Like, I was not thrilled because of the fact that, like, he was not playing well his final season in a bit. But, you know, like, I liked Conroy just as much as a person from back when we got him right through to today. Uh, you know, it was not the person that didn't like. It's just that, you know, at, you know, for me like the team always comes first and you know like what's going on right now is not working and the flames need to figure a new way of going about it and that means making some hard choices and unfortunately some people that all flames fans like might have to move in order to get that to happen and sometimes you bring in somebody like better yeah well, a guy that we well, like you know, a lot of people complained like when the Flames signed Derek Ryan because oh, well, we already have Backlund and this and that and you know like that oh, well, that's a redundant signing, and yet he's emerged as being like our third most dependable player on the team, and you know that's just a new person that you brought in and he you know he brought something better and you know sometimes different is good and you know it what we're currently doing isn't working like the flames as the one guy on twitter said that we've only won one playoff game since we beat vancouver in the first round well two one in that series one last year but still like that's not success at all (laughs) and you know like this team needs to take that next step and figure out a way of 
it's just like in the early 80s when the Flames were going up and losing to the Oilers all the time. They had to make adjustments on their team in order to take that next step in order to beat Edmonton because that was the important thing because they'd meet them in the playoffs and lose. And Calgary needs to make adjustments so that way they can actually win playoff games. Well, talking about players we all like, a uh, player that seems to be a fan favorite around here, especially among the faithful, is Yuso Valimaki. We know he's been out with a knee injury all season, and it looks like he's back on the ice. He's skated two days in a row, so uh, hopefully he'll be back. I I know a lot of fans want to see him. I think the best course of action is to send him to the Stockton Heat. He hasn't played all year. I think you send him down there and let him, you know, get top minutes and play there before you bring him back up. What do you think, Matt? I think that he, at a minimum, needs to go down for a conditioning stint. Um, and I'd le- leave him basically until the trade I deadline. I mean, you can clear waivers, so you don't technically out. need him on a conditioning stint. No, I know, but throw him down there on that and see, see where he's at. Yeah, and like if he needs to just stay down there, then you just leave him down there. But, you know, one way or the other, he'll be back. It's just whether that's sooner than later or, you know, and like if the Flames do sell at the deadline, you know, and you get rid of Hamannick and Brody, then he will be up here and playing. <laughs> Guaranteed. Yeah, but I think but, you got to start um, him off in Stockton. Yeah, I agree. Well, with that, uh, we wanted to let everyone know about a fun event we've got coming up this week. You've heard Jeff Gregory on our show, the man who calls himself Stockton's Finest. He is getting called up, as he likes to say this week. He and Mrs. Finest, his wife, are coming from Stockton to Calgary. So they're going from beautiful California to the snow here. And they're going to be in town on Thursday for the Predators game. Um, they're holding a bit of a meetup before the game, if anyone wants to go. It'll be at Bottle Screw Bill's Pub, which is downtown at 140 10th Avenue Southwest. He'll be there at 5 o'clock until they've got to leave for the game, and then they'll be back afterwards. I'm going to be there. I'll try to be there for most of the game, before and, and during and after. Uh, I think Matt's going to try and drop by for a bit somewhere in there. So if you guys want to come out and meet us, say hi to Jeff. Uh, talking about the Stockton Heat, we'd love to meet you. It's a great chance for our listeners to meet each other. Come meet us, hang out. So Bottle Screw Bills starting at 5 o'clock until whenever the party ends. I guess it'll probably depend if the Flames win or lose, how late we all want to stick around afterwards. If it's another game like that Oilers game, I think we'll pay our tabs and get the heck out of there pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, let's let's get together, let's hang out, and let's watch the Flames together. Matt, with that, should we predict that game and the rest of the game for the week and see how we think we're going to do? Sure. Uh, we got three games in the docket before we record next. The Flames have San Jose here in the Dome tomorrow night. Obviously, Nashville on the 6th, which Jeff Gregory will be at. And then we make a little bit of a road trip to the uh, West to take on the Vancouver Canucks on Saturday night for Hockey Night in Canada. Um, you and I are going to record before the San Jose game the following Monday. So we have San Jose at home, Nashville at home, Vancouver on the road. What are you going with? Two points against Nashville. You think we win against Nashville and lose the other two? Yeah. So that's a loss to San Jose and Vancouver. I'm going to be a little more optimistic than you. I think they win San Jose because I think after that Edmonton loss, they need a win. And I think Ward's going to have them ready for that win. Um, I, I think they'll they'll be hungry for a win. If they're not, something's wrong. Um, and I think they can beat Nashville, but I think they lose to Vancouver. I think it's going to be a tough road swing for these guys. They got four road games, but I think they can take these two at home. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Like, this to me is the season, the next, like, two weeks is... Because, like, they're playing a bunch of really bad teams, and... You know, they should win at least six of the eight games. Well, let's just break that down because you've mentioned but, that a few times for people listening who don't know the schedule. So if we take a look at where the Flames are at, they have, as we said, San Jose, Nashville at home. Then they go on a four-game swing. Uh, Vancouver, San Jose, L.A., Anaheim, all on the road. Uh, then they're back here for Chicago, Anaheim. They get a three-day break and Boston at home. And then they've got, what, a five-game road swing, I think? Uh, Detroit, Boston, Nashville, Tampa, 
and Florida going right into March. So only one back-to-back this month, L.A. Anaheim. But, yeah, you're right. A lot of subpar teams here. Yeah, like between now and the Anaheim game on the 17th, like there's a lot of really bad teams. Like it's basically all of the losers from the Western Conference plus Vancouver over the next eight games. And yeah, there is a back-to-back and one of them's in the Honda Center, but still, like those teams are the teams that if you're going to be a playoff team, you have to just put these teams away. Like they're all bad you shouldn't be, so go out and get the two points. Well, and if you and look at where we are in the standings, can't... we got 60 points in the first wild card. Arizona has got 59 and second wild card. And Vancouver's got 65. Like this, if this team can play the way we know they can, this could be the ro- the swing where they make up those points. Well, like there was one stat that I heard today that like I had to actually go and look at it like in person on the standings and the schedule and all that the flames have played 52 games this season and they have only won in regulation 17 times yep like that you're only winning one third of your games in regulation like that's really really not good and so like that's why Like, I've been leaning more towards selling because of the fact that, you know, like, this team has been bad and basically bailed out by the shootout and the overtime. But, you know, like, that's really not a good place to be in. And, like, the Flames have been largely lucky that, like, the rest of the Pacific Division is a tire fire as well. Otherwise, like, the, like, frankly, if this was any other year, the Flames are probably 12th or 13th in the standings right now. And, like, oh, we need a seven-game winning streak just to be relevant. And, you know, like, that's why this next eight games is, like, the do-or-die of this season. Because, you know, like, they've been pretty horrible thus far this year. And, like, that's not good. And if they can get on a winning streak and take off, that's everything's fine. You know, we saw St. Louis, they were the worst team in the NHL at, you know, like this time last year, a week ago. So, you know, so like, you know, it's possible. It's just. Well, in our last 10, we've gone 6 3 and 1. So we've got, what, 12, 13 points out of that. So if we could go the same pace in the next 10, that puts us at 73 points. Obviously, everybody else is going to move as well, but if we're at 60 points now and St. Louis is number one in the West at 70, I mean, if we can do 6-3-1 and one in the next 10, that could put us number one in the Pacific very easily. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Like, if the Flames can continue, like, even over the next 20 games being the equivalent of that like you're at 86 points after 73 games and that's basically your playoff team at that point so you know it's just that they need to do that and you know this team has been so up and down like even the game against st louis to the game the second game against edmonton you know great effort in the first one and then uh what was that in the third one like you, even now we're into February and we still don't know what this team we is. We need consistency. <laughs> like, yeah, like anything. And, like, that's one of the hallmarks of a contending team. Like, you look at teams like St. Louis, Washington, and Boston, and Pittsburgh, and In like any those sport, teams. Any team that you're, wins is you're consistent. You're getting, yeah. Yeah, like, you're getting, like, even though they lose games, like, you're getting what you expect from them each time and yeah calgary it's uh what's this team gonna be today i don't know or even what's this team gonna be in this period i don't know well matt let, why don't we leave <laughs> so, it there for the week and we can discuss this with anyone who shows up at bottle screw bills on thursday maybe they've got some other sure. uh, some other thoughts for us and we'll come back and see how the flames do as they start off this uh this road trip next monday 
Yeah, I just want to say that before we go, this has been the weirdest season I think I've watched in the NHL in a very, very Is long Is that why you've no hair left? You've been pulling it all out this season? Oh, that went when I was 18, so, you know, that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it's been a weird season for the NHL. It's been a weird season for the Flames in general. Um, but I think, you know, we do need to, as we talked about, capitalize on it while we can. And if that means moving assets, that's what we got to do. But we'll see how the team does in the next couple weeks. Well, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.